Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this InfoFish Salmon eDialogue Asia 2021. Um, my name is uh, Api Meleke Bakanasinga, and I am the Trade Promotion Officer for InfoFish. I'm also the uh, moderator for today's event. I see that we have about uh, 55 participants that are coming, that are here to, uh, at this event. And, uh, and I'm, I hope that we have more participants that are coming later. Uh, the whole idea of this event is to uh, under, get an understanding on the, on the trends in the consumption of salmon in the Asia region. And I'm uh, pleased to say here that this event is being uh, supported and endorsed by the Norwegian Seafood Council and also uh, sponsored by Morel. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank the two agencies for their support and their kind contribution to this event. Um, just to quickly run through the flow of the program for today's event, uh, we will start off with a, a keynote address on the Salmon Revolution in Asia by Mr. Asbjorn uh, Rothbard, the Director of Southeast Asia Norwegian Seafood Council. Um, and then we have a presentation from Paul, Mr. Paul Andel, who's going to talk about uh, how salmon markets in Asia survived the pandemic, a cross-country comparison. And then um, we will have a presentation from Ms. Fatima Ferdows, uh, on the topic, a consumer uh, perspective, the popularity of salmon. And then we have Mr. Diego, who's going to be talking to us about the salmon processing, catering to the consumer. And then we have uh, Mr. Gonzalo Campos, who's going to end off the presentations on the packaging innovation, adapting to convenience. Um, so I'll, I'll allow the, the, the panelists to introduce themselves during their, their presentations, at the beginning of their presentations. Um, just to quickly run through the guidelines for all our participants, uh, you can uh, always uh, post questions to the panelists, and you can do that by uh, posting on the Q&A box, which is available at the bottom of your screen. Uh, also, please mention the name of the speaker that you would like to address your question to. Uh, there's a chat box uh, also available on the bottom of your screen. Uh, this chat box is not moderated, but uh, participants can provide their feedbacks and uh, queries in the chat box. Uh, we will also have the InfoFish Secretariat who is going to be uh, assisting you if you have any queries. Uh, there's also a poll question, poll questions at the bottom of your screen, so we would appreciate you if you could respond to some of the poll questions, basically just for uh, improvement purposes. Like this. Um, the recording of this uh, event is will be available after the event, uh, and this is going to be posted on the InfoFish um, YouTube channel. Uh, there's going to be a link that's going to be shared on the chat box. Uh, you can have access to the recording of the webinar. You can also um, view the view our past webinars in this uh, YouTube channel. So to quickly start off with our presentation uh, today, uh, our event today, we have the keynote address from Mr. Asperjohn Woodford. Uh, unfortunately, he's not able to I'll be here, but he's, uh, he's, he has sent his pre-recorded uh, speech. So I'll now uh, hand over to Aftar to begin off the video presentation. Hello, my name is Ospion Varvik Rökvet. I'm the Regional Director of the Norwegian Seafood Council in Southeast Asia. I wanna thank the InfoFish that I have the opportunity to speak to you at this uh, uh, e-dialogue uh, conference uh, for salmon in South or salmon in Asia. My presentation is called the salmon revolution in Southeast Asia. Um, but first I will talk a little bit about uh, how Norwegian seafood uh, export has developed over the past years. Um, last year we exported two point no, sorry, 106 billion Norwegian knock in seafood in general, 
that was 2.7 million tons of seafood, counting 37 million meals every day globally in 154 countries. The split between uh, uh, aquaculture and wild fisheries, you can see on this graph, it um, has developed in value uh, hugely for uh, aquaculture. From 1991 and 2011 until today, it's, we have seen a huge increase in the value of, of um, the export of export value of uh, salmon and pure trout products. Uh, the development of the wild caught fisheries has been pretty stable, but has increased some over the year. The years. But what is interesting to see is that the total export volume from aquaculture and wild fish fisheries is fairly stable uh, between 2.5 million tons and 2.7 million tons over the 10 past years. Um, when we see on the different regions, we can see that Asia accounts for almost 19% of the seafood export from Norway um, and had last year a development, uh, a negative development in value of almost 10% and almost 5% in volume. And this is due to the uh, corona crisis and how the, the um, transportation and log logistics has affected uh, the seafood market. A lot of the seafood from Norway goes fresh directly to the Southeast Asian countries and, and Asian countries. And this was, of course, affected by the, the global lockdown we had from March 2020. My presentation today will be about the what we call the salmon revolution in Southeast Asia. I'll talk about the emerging markets, how this affects the, the salmon export. I will talk about the Japanese-Norwegian partnership, salmon consu uh, consumer perception, and then also how country of origin has affected the, um, the salmon sales and how this affects the choices of the consumer. I will talk about salmon as a flagship in the fish counter. And then finally, how the online trend has have affected uh, salmon sales uh, lately and how this will affect the sales going forward. First, to the emerging markets. Southeast Asia is getting the taste of salmon and pure trout. And we see very rapidly when salmon is introduced in a market, it grows quite fast. Uh, and it, what we've seen uh, in these countries is that it starts as a frozen product, but then it develops uh, and goes over to be, become more a uh, fresh product. If we look at the ASEAN countries altogether, they will become, within the next decade, the fourth largest economy in the world. So this is a, it's a region that is growing uh, quite rapidly. And we, we see that the middle class is increasing uh, or even booming, and this will double the spending uh, and salmon will become a product that more and more people have um, means to, to buy. Um, Asia will, in the next decade, increase the consumption of salmon per capita. And if we compare to Europe, for instance, we see that, that many countries in Europe, they have a pretty high consumption of, of salmon per capita compared to Asia. So I think, think that the percentage growth in, in consumption per capita will be highest in, in Asia in the years to come. This slide is, is an example of how fast salmon export uh, grows, for instance, towards Thailand. 1,700% in 10 years in fresh salmon export. And this gives a picture of, of when they get a taste of the, of when a market get a taste of the, the fresh uh, salmon, we get a rapid growth. And this is a picture that I, I think we'll see in, in other countries in the years to come. Even in uh, the time during the pandemic, we see increase in uh, salmon export from uh, Norway. Um, if we look at the countries here in Southeast Asia, with Thailand on, on top, we see that in, uh, in 2020, we had a 
reduction compared to 2019. But if you look at 2021 so far, we have a 34% increase compared to 2020. And we have also an increase compared to uh, 2019, which was a more normal year. And this is without the tourist industry. And this means that there are a, a underlying growth in the market, which is uh, from domestic consumption. Uh, other markets like, South, uh, like Singapore, which is more mature, had a, a decrease in 2020, and it's, uh, it's on the same level in, so far in 2021. If you look at GDP for the countries in ASEAN, we, we can see that expectation for 2021 is quite high for many of most of the countries. And, uh, and the biggest expectation or the highest expectation is in uh, Vietnam, Philippines, and Malaysia. But if we look at the ASEAN countries uh, uh, when it comes to size, Indonesia is one of the, is the biggest market. And this is a market that, that salmon have not got a, a steady market access for, for Norwegian salmon. And actually right now it's quite difficult with, with export from, uh, from Norway to Indonesia. So, but if this is something that comes around and, and uh, we, we find solutions on, Indonesia is a market that we can expect will grow quite rapidly uh, in the years to come. So, the Japanese or the Norwegian Japanese partnership. In 1990, no, in 1986, a group of Norwegian businessmen traveled to Japan with the goal of introducing Norwegian salmon as a sushi or sashimi product. Before this, salmon or mostly wild salmon was not used as a topping in, in sushi and sashimi in in, in Japan. So this was kind of a bold move to, to go to Japan and, and introduce this, uh, this Atlantic salmon or Norwegian salmon as a product for sushi. We know now the history and uh, sushi and uh, Japanese sushi and sashimi has going uh, global and have been uh, the biggest global food trend in uh, the past, over the past 30 to 30 years. And this wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for this group of, of businessmen that introduced Norwegian salmon. So Norwegian salmon and the Japanese uh, sushi tradition is now forever linked together. And we can see this in consumer uh, studies. People associate salmon with Japanese dishes and sushi, sashimi, and they also have an uh, association, of course, to the the red color and as a saltwater fish, but the link between Japan and uh, or sushi and salmon is extremely valuable and has driven the consumption in almost every country that the salmon has been introduced to. So of course in Southeast Asia uh, this link is extremely important and Bangkok for instance is one of the cities in the world with the highest density of Japanese restaurants. It's more than 2,200 uh, Japanese style restaurants in, in Bangkok. And this of course has a huge impact on the salmon consumption. Then consumer uh, per perception. Salmon very fast becomes one of the most popular fish in almost every market that it's introduced. Um, it, uh, it becomes the most popular because it's extremely versatile and can be used in many different dishes. Um, and, and this uh, position is something that uh, is extremely important for, for the growth of, uh, of salmon in Southeast Asia. If you look at the statistics, it's, uh, the perception is, is freshness, is omega-3, is um, the orange color, it's hygiene, it's full of protein, and it's uh, linked to, as I said before, sashimi, and it's sweet taste, and it's no fishy smell. So, so this is a fish that has, uh, has uh, perception among consumers that are extremely positive and makes it uh, kind of the superhero of the 
the fish counter. And then origin matters. This is a thing that, that has been extremely important for us in the Norwegian Seafood Council to, to work with, to tell the story about Norwegian salmon. Because it's linked to Japan, uh, many people in Southeast Asia uh, feel or believe that, that the fish comes from Japan. But in every market that, that the Seafood Council have been, been telling the story about the Norwegian origin, people get, get this, message, this message, message comes across. And that this is also extremely beneficial for the salmon because Norway has a, has a great position uh, in the mind of many consumers in Southeast Asia and is also linked to sustainability and the clean waters of Norway. So seven out of 10 consumers um, say that country of origin is important when they buy seafood. And when it comes to sustainability, this is also extremely important for consumers in Southeast Asia. 81% think that sustainability is important when choosing where to buy salmon no, or seafood. And when we ask people how sustainable they consider fish farming, wild fisheries, poultry, pork, and beef, uh, fish farming com comes on top. 85% thinks that or believes that fish farming is sustainable, whereas only 70% believes that beef is a sustainable um, pro source of protein. And this link between uh, uh, sustainability and the origin is extremely important. And that's also uh, one of the reasons why we believe that people are interested in, in paying extra for knowing their religion. So 82% <laughs> origin, sorry. 82% expect that seafood they buy is clearly marked with origin. 76% 70, 70, is willing to pay more if it's clearly marked. And here's the thick thing. 83% is willing to pay more if the seafood is uh, clearly marked with, uh, with the, the Norwegian origin. So this means that, that, that people feel that when the fish is from Norway, this gives, gives them an extra value. Then uh, about the flagship of the fish counter. Uh, wherever you go in, in supermarkets, you can see that salmon is, is taking a bigger and bigger place in, uh, in the fish counter. And this is motivated in, for instance, in <clears throat> Europe, you can see that salmon becomes uh, a traffic builder. It's a product that often are on promotion to attract customers to come to the store. And it's usually priced between 25, uh, between 15 and 25 euros per kilo for, for fillets. When it comes to Thailand, for instance, which is a, a, a growing market or an emerging market, we see that the, the fish or the salmon is priced a lot higher and this, the, the, the spend or, or the, the the variation between price of salmon goes from 35 to 60 euros a kilo. So this means that this, uh, there's a huge opportunity for the retailers and the importers to, 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 to earn more money from uh, the product. And I think also this is one of the, the, the drivers of, uh, of, the, um, of in emer emerging markets. Many see the opportunity in a product that is so popular among the consumers. And they also want to be a part of this, this business because uh, a fresh food business has a, a, a fast cash flow. And this also means that if you succeed, if you're able to build up a consumer base, you're able to build up a distribution that take, takes care of the value, the, the cold chain, and you can you can present uh, this high-end product to, to consumers on a steady, steady basis, you are able to, 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 uh, to have a markup on the product that is, is, uh, can, can give you a good earning. And this is a motivation for many people to, to get into the salmon business. And this means that this helps evolve the, the, the business in emerging markets. 
five hours a day use young people on their smartphone uh, every day. And um, on average is 4.3. This is numbers from, from Southeast Asia. And this use of the smartphone has increased extremely rapidly over the past years. But of course, during COVID, uh, the COVID lockdown, this has increased even more. This means that products that should be available for consumers need to be on the, those platforms that the consumers are present, meaning that for salmon, you can not only be point of sale in store or at the restaurant, you need to be point of sale on uh, the different um, digital uh, apps and places where the, the, the consumers are online. Therefore, uh, the CP Council changed rapidly during uh, COVID crisis and did all over um, uh, marketing uh, online. Um, and we see a, a huge uh, or a dramatic change in distribution where online becomes extremely more important. And you see online apps like Grab, which is also linked to a transportation service. So more and more of uh, the fresh seafood products, either a salmon fillet, but also a ready-made meal from a restaurant, is delivered directly to the consumers uh, by the Grab motorcycles, but it's then ordered on the Grab app, app or directly on, uh, on the online platform from the different uh, restaurants. So this is a change that is, is, has been going over, has been, been something that has, has been changing over years but has changed very rapidly during the last year because of COVID. And you, we see that a lot of old people um, have done their first buy online. And this means that when you get experience with the convenience of having, having your food delivered on your doorstep, fresh, and you are, can be certain that the, the cold chain is not broken, uh, you can see that this experience will will increase the sales going forward. So the presence of, uh, of uh, marketing or marketing salmon online would be extremely important in the years to come. So to sum up, um, if I should get a salmon development forecast, I would believe that the, the global demand of, of salmon will probably be higher than the the growth in productions in the year, year to come, meaning that I think we'll need to see that, that I, I think we'll see that salmon prices will be fairly high going forward. Um, the biggest growing markets in uh, globally will be uh, China, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and uh, maybe Russia if, um, if we get a reopening of export between Norway and Russia. In Southeast Asia, I believe that the biggest growth market would be Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and Philippines. Uh, Indonesia, will, we will need to see that, uh, that uh, the market access situation becomes better. However, uh, Indonesia is the biggest market in, of ASEAN countries and, and has a huge population and you have a huge growth in, in the middle class. Uh, so I, I would think that we will overcome the challenges when it comes to market access because the demand for salmon in this market would be uh, uh, growing rapidly going forward, meaning that also you will need to have suppliers to, to keep the price on, on a, a, a level that is affordable for the consumers. Okay, that was that. Thank you so much for having me uh, at this uh, seminar. Uh, I hope uh, you are, if you have any questions or you would like to contact me, please don't uh, hesitate. Send me an email or uh, call me. I will be happy to answer your questions. Take care. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that is um, Mr. Asbjorn Rothfeldt. Uh,
providing us an overview of the Norwegian seafood export in uh, globally and also in Asia, and also telling us about the, the importance of the Southeast Asia market and the salmon revolution in the, the Southeast Asia market as well. Um, I see that uh, some participants have uh, raised hands. So if you would like to uh, post a question, please do so in the Q&A box, which is available at the bottom of your screen. Or if you have any queries, there is, there is a chat box that's available at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will move on now to the second speaker of uh, the Salman E Dialogue. And I now invite Mr. Paul to uh, begin his presentation. And uh, before he uh, uh, presents, he can introduce himself. So over to you, Paul. Okay, waiting to share my screen. Okay, you can see my screen now. I hope. Uh, um, not yet, Mr. Paul. Okay. Well, you click ah. on the share screen. And I try once more. Okay, sure. Then. Okay. Yes, correct. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Paul Andal. Um, I would say I will be. I've been working in the industry for uh, uh, <laughs> over 40 years. I started in the late 70s by uh, feeding salmon, uh, a lot <laughs> different industry. Then I guess uh, we, we were feeding the salmon from small boxes with feed, uh, throwing the feed by our, our hands in the cages. Um, quite different industry now, as you all know. Um, I've been working for the Norwegian Seafood Council since uh, 94 as an analyst, uh, and I've been analyzing, I guess, uh, <laughs> almost all species traded, traded in the world. Um, and for the last uh, 15 years, uh, my main focus has been salmon. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the trade flow uh, to Asia. Austrian has also already um, had some of the figures up uh, and I will uh, repeat some of that. Um, okay. So, no, it's not uh, changing. Uh, can you click uh, next I, next on the keyboard? Next arrow on the keyboard? Um, no. Uh, okay, maybe I need to sh I need to stop. I, 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 can, I, I, can, I can stop sharing and go back. Yes, sure. Better. Okay. So now you can see it. Yes. Can you click on the on the slideshow and then you press the next button on the keyboard? Arrow button on the keyboard. Um yeah, but it's uh, it's it, I can see that my screen is not uh do you want? Do you want? Do you want to? Uh, no. Okay. no. Yeah. No. Sure. Okay. Okay. Now okay. <laughs> but it, uh, let me see. Um, I will start with the production of Atlantic salmon during the pandemic. Um, there were no major effects on the global salmon production in 2020 as a result of the COVID-19. Uh, however, due to low profitability in Chile, less fish were released there, which will affect the slaughter, especially in the second half of 2021. 
um, in total for air perhaps a decrease of as much as 60%. Uh, globally, an increase of 2% is expected. And Norway will contribute to most of the growth. As an increase of about 7% is expected here, um, according to Contali. But so far, so, uh, this year, the export growth is 13% from Norway. So somewhat lower growth is needed in the second half of the year if the forecast is to be fulfilled. Uh, if you look at the biomass figures, um, it is this from, uh, from May, and the volume of fish in the sea is 8% higher compared to last year. Um, so I expect that we will still have a growth in the second half uh, from Norway. Um, on minor changes regarding the, the, the COVID-19 uh, can be mentioned, some delayed slaughter, we saw that from, from the beginning of the, the, the COVID-19 uh, period, where some producers, uh, they, they, um, they reduced or postponed the, the, the slaughter due to the sharp decline in, in price. Um, but if you look at the production as a whole, I think it has gone better than fair uh, with just a few closures of slaughterhouses and processors. Um, you look at the price. Um, as most of you know, the price of salmon has fluctuated a lot during the period of Corona. Normally, the price is lower in the second half of the year compared with the first half of the year, mainly due to the increased volume, both from Norway and globally. Uh, when this corona started, the price was at a historically high level, but the price fell sharply at the beginning of the pandemic due to increased uncertainty in the distribution, transfer of consumption from restaurants to home consumption, that was a global event, and uh, increased distribution costs for both fresh and frozen products, and not least reduced freight capacity, which also affected the trade flow of salmon. Um, in particular, this has led to whole fish export to USA from Norway has been taken over by fillets. There are also, has also been a growth export of fillets at the expense of whole fish to our markets such, such as Japan. Looking at the development during the first half of the year, the average price this year, the average price shown in the box in the upper right corner is higher than last year, measured in US dollars, barely 3% higher as we can see. While in NOC and Euro, the price is lower. This was also the case in June. In US dollars, the price was 4% uh, higher compared to, compared to June last year. Uh, while the export volume converted into whole fish equivalents was 20% higher. Although the price is lower than in June 2019, recent developments reflect that demand for salmon increases as restaurants reopen and the trade flow and logistics are gradually normalized. Let's see if I can switch one. Okay. Um, here we see the monthly development in total export volume for main producing countries of Atlantic salmon, converted into whole and gutted fish equivalents. To convert a factor to head on gutted, the volume must be reduced by 10%. Supply of fresh fish fell to Asia, the dark blue bar while frozen increase 
which meant that the pro proportion of fresh salmon to Asia fell to 66% in 2020, compared with 74% uh, in 2019. Overall, there was a reduction of 6% in 2020. As you can see, there are red numbers for fresh salmon until February this year, when the supply of fresh salmon started to grow again. For frozen salmon, the supply, the supply has largely increased during the pandemic. If we compare the period February to April with the corresponding period in 2020, volume has increased by 18% compared with the corresponding period 2019, the increase is 9%. So I would agree that the negative trend we have seen during the first 12 months of the pandemic is reversed. Let us focus on fresh salmon. Norwegian salmon has had a higher proportion of fresh salmon supply during the pandemic than before COVID-19 occurred. But we see that this fluctuates from month to month. For example, in April this year, the share fell compared with the share in March uh, last year, which is due to increased volume from other producing nations. If you look at the period February to April. Norway is the nation that accounts for most of the growth of just over 14,000 tons to Asia. While other nations have been relatively, had a relative, relatively greater growth. Export from Chile are still declining over the three month period, but in April, there was an export of uh, 1,500 tons. Um, you can see that this, uh, it's growing here a little bit. And, um, and this is 60% higher than, it, than in the same period last year. And this is only half of the volume, but this is still the half of the volume that we saw from Chile on average in 2019. Okay. The overall impression is that many of the largest Asian markets did well during the pandemic. In 2020, we have seen an increase in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Vietnam. While there has been a reduction in direct export to China, Hong Kong, United Arab Emirates, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Okay, so, but if you look at the last period, period from February to April, the Asian markets are back on the growth trend and the fresh salmon is driving the growth in the largest markets. The exception is Israel, where the supply of frozen salmon has picked up. For markets like Thailand, there are record high volumes. This is even though the tourists have, uh, have not been present, lots of tourists have has affected the total volume to all markets. When we now see growth again, it indicates that this increased consumption, the increased consumption among the country's own inhabitants. I think the increased consumption we now see locally will continue. This will come on top of increased consumption caused by increased tourism when the pandemic is over. I expect that the demand for salmon will increase in all Asian markets as a result, which many know had tried salmon for the first time and learned to appreciate the salmon's qualities both at home and out at the restaurants. I do not have statistics for other supplier nations of salmon 
but for Norwegian salmon, the export volume to Asia increased by 46% in whole fish equivalents in June. Uh, this is even though the price for fresh salmon uh, totally from Norway increased by 3% in US dollars. The demand will continue to increase. And I think that pandemic has, uh, has given a new boost to the growth. That was what I had. So I will open up for, for questions. Thank you, thank you, Paul, for that uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I just have a quick question for you. Uh, you mentioned about the Atlantic salmon production in your slides. Uh, so the question is, the, will the Atlantic salmon production increase in the next few years? Yes, I, I think so. I think that um, Chile, they will, they will bounce back uh back to normal uh, production quantities uh, I, I expect to see uh, increased uh, production in, in other producing countries uh for norway um we'll have uh, well i would say historically quite high production growth this year uh and expect that we will continue to increase in a slow pay, uh, phase uh, the next coming years on average, uh, maybe um, let's say three to four year percent a year uh, over the next 10 years due to uh, uh, increased usage of bigger, small, biggest sized fish released into the sea. That is uh, the, the sea phase is, is, uh, is uh, due to the, uh, I would say, restrictions, restrictions in, in, the, in the production. So it, if you can can um, short that period in the sea, you you, you uh, produce more, um, and of course there is still a, 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 a possibility to to increase the the biomass in the sea by by uh, uh, the, the traffic light system, increase biomass by by six percent every second year. Um, and of course, we have new technology, um, both onshore that will grow and also offshore in the, in the future. So it, I guess that uh, I expect that the, the, the production globally will increase and uh, it, so it will in no way. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I have another question here. Um, this is in relation to Asian companies buying over salmon producers in Norway. For example, Mitsubishi Corporation in Japan that bought the Norway's uh, ceramic uh, group. Mm. Um, so the question is, have you seen this trend expanding uh, so that in time more salmon will be produced in Asia? And if so, how will it impact on producers in Norway? Um. With new technology, I expect that we will see uh, salmon produced in, in, in most countries, but it will take time. Uh, and uh, there are still a lot of challenges uh, regarding such a production. And um, of course, regarding the fresh fish to Asia, um, you don't need to, 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 to Escape the flight costs, and uh, so it's it's a possibility. But I still see that fresh Norwegian salmon will, will enter the Asian markets because the market cake will grow so much uh, that I think it will be hard to fulfill the, the the total demand in the market, and and the market cake will grow uh, maybe as as fast as the production. It means that we will have. Uh, reasonably high prices. Uh, also, the next at least ten years and and maybe longer. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, response and that presentation. Uh, I have questions that are coming in from participants. I'll maybe address that at the very end of all the presentations. I'll come back to you on that. Uh, so, from the salmon markets in Asia, we go down to consumer. 
consumer's perspective. I welcome Fatima Ferdows uh, to, uh, to, to present. So over to you, Fatima. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Fatima Ferdaus. Basically, um, I'm a fishery consultant, or rather I have been dealing with fisheries, particularly market and trade for the last 40 years also. Um, but when it comes to consumption, um, I'm a newcomer. I have started eating salmon very, very recently, um, not long ago. So, but my story with, an, or particularly with the Norwegian or my link with the Norwegian salmon goes back to late nineties. Uh, I must thank the Norwegian Salmon Council for giving me the opportunity to, to, to share my views today um, as a consumer and because I had a chance to be in Norway in late 90s, again, as a consultant to talk about Asian markets when there was hardly any Norwegian farm salmon other than Japan in Asia. And at that time, um, we just talked about the general market or, or the, the consumption trend or trend of fishery products in Asia. I didn't know what a fjord looked like at that time. And because here you say that the, the, the fewer trout, but I had an opportunity or I had the beautiful opportunity to, to visit Geiranger Fjord in that, and it was summer, June, beautiful weather. So thank you very much for bringing me back in this loop and talk about the popularity of farm salmon where I became a newborn consumer, um, must say, so I would like to share my views. Now, pictures tell thousand words. So here are some products that talks about Asian consumption pattern of salmon in my first slide. So when I go to the second slide, I will start with the section of popularity of farm salmon. And then in the second section, I'll talk about consumer's perspective. Okay, here it is. In fact, whatever I'm going to talk or share with you, has, some of those are already been talked about um, by the, uh, in the presentation of Norwegian Seafood Council and also uh, the two presentations on, on Norwegian salmon trade uh, in, in the global and with respect to Asian markets. So as highlighted in the Norwegian Seafood Council presentation, you know, seafood consumption is really reasonably high in this part of the world. This is one of the reasons they are very rightly targeted to, to promote their product and successfully did that over the last 20 years. And they have chosen Japan as, as the main partner at the beginning. And that has really helped to, to rather spread out the good news about, about salmon consumption or uh, availability uh, in the global market and particularly in Asia. So it is the regular supply or stable supply that guaranteed the market acceptance or consumer acceptance in this part of the world, although at high prices. 20 years ago, I don't see any price change over the last 20 years in Asia for fresh Norwegian salmon, whatever I have seen, years ago, still I'm paying the same price. Or we are paying the same price for Norwegian salmon. So it's a high price product, but with the increase in income of Asian per capita income and, and the disposable income of Asian and Southeast Asia, Far Eastern people, consumption has gone up. They really didn't, or they don't look uh, or, or consider much when they go for salmon. 
And then the, uh, it has been popularized again by the sushi restaurants in Japan, where in Japan itself, nor salmon has taken over quite a big share of, of the popular, uh, another fish, which is tuna. So now salmon sushi or salmon sashimi is more popular around the year where tuna has become kind of seasonal preference for many consumers. Or even in a sushi bowl, you, you see uh, more salmon, less tuna. Uh, mixture of whether it is a salmon bowl, whether it is, uh, it, is the, it is the raw product or whether it's a cooked product. Because in Japan, it, is, it, is, it has a, a salmon is, is really a product, indigenous fish, indigenous in Japanese culture. They start their breakfast with salmon and rice. Uh, so, and then they go for, for lunch, which is bento, with fried salmon, and then again, again and again, so many. So I, I look at the Japanese cookbook, there are more than 100 recipes for salmon cooking in Japanese style. So for other part of Asia, it is exotic, it is, it is a chic product, particularly to the younger people. So they said, oh, what did you go? Well, well, let's go and have some sushi. What sushi? It's a salmon sushi. Okay, which is very easily available nowadays in supermarkets. Of course, I'm, I'm not talking about the pandemic period, but before that. Or you go to the restaurant, almost in every restaurant in the menu, salmon is there uh, for, 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 food, for any kind of food preparation. And the important thing, which I believe has really impacted uh, the mind of Southeast, particularly Southeast Asian consumer, is the omega-3 factor. Many people ask me, oh, are you with the fishery sector? Yeah. Do you know that I make omega-3 fish? Omega-3 fish, uh, yeah. It takes me about a few seconds to realize what is this omega-3 fish. Oh, okay. It's salmon. So, and... Because of this health uh, relating, related to the health aspect of life, it's really become, it picked up, the consumption picked up among different age group, particularly among the middle age and above because it's a healthy fish. And then orange color of, of salmon, it was, it was mentioned in the Norwegian Civil Council presentation. Yeah, you know, red and orange are auspicious color, particularly for the oriental people. So when they eat it, even as a raw, not for sushi sashimi, but even isang that in Southeast Asia and Southern part of China, they use during the Chinese New Year. Nowadays, it's a very common fish in that dish where, they, where you lift your fork up with the salmon and other product, the higher you lift, the more luck you get. So here comes the salmon bringing good luck and not many fishes in the world have that kind of color. And more and most importantly, I must highlight, I mean, I mean, point out this. You know, there, there is a concern about palm fish. Palm fish is not good. Is it good? The, the feed and these and that and that, particularly among the senior, senior people. But sal and when it comes to salmon, they don't think it's a farm fish. It is not promoted as a farm fish. It's promoted as a marine fish, which is, I think, perfect. And... Uh, it works very, very well to consumers, uh, to influence consumer behavior or acceptance for, for the product. Now, I would like to go back to, uh, to some of the, of the data that, that was presented earlier. And this is something about the salmon trade in the region. You can see during 2008 and 2020, there was a 58% rise in imports in these 14 markets where these dots are the ASEAN members. And, and even during the pandemic, it was 12% imports were 12% high in these markets. So now it's a market area where almost more than half a million tons of salmon, fresh and frozen, uh, it is faded in, I'm not talking about South Asia, 
I'm just talking about Southeast Asian Far East. So that is more than half a million tons uh, traded in this part of the world, which had a value of an import value of about 4 billion US dollar. Now, if you, if we, um, if we, okay, let's see why it's not moving. We go to the next slide. Uh, Madam, can you click on the slide and then you click a uh, button on the keyboard, the next button. On the okay, keyboard. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Jojo. So this one is about fresh and frozen uh, salmon imports in the region. Now, as we can see from here, this is fresh salmon and that is frozen salmon. And this is pre-pandemic period and this is the pandemic period. We can see that the, the import demand declined for fresh product with no obvious reason, transportation and all those things. Uh, and, uh, and, the for, and, and the demand uh, decline in the catering trade, particularly in the restaurant, whereas the frozen salmon imports really went up. And if we look at the ranking, also we see for fresh China in the last three years, China is number one, followed by Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, Hong Kong, and other countries. Whereas for frozen product, Japan is number one, followed by China, and then Thailand and Vietnam and Taiwan and Philippines, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. So the Malaysian status is more or less I can talk about here. It's more ranking is almost the same for fresh and frozen product, but it's quite different um, for other countries importing this product. So um, altogether, the the market imported about this regional market 163,000 tons of fresh salmon last year against 100 and almost 200,000 tons a year ago, whereas this is a decline, whereas we see that imports of frozen salmon increased. So that shows the preference for salmon and also consumer preference for frozen product in general. And now I'd just like to highlight a little bit or show you the overall export trend of Norway and, uh, and Chile for salmon into the global market to see the supremacy of, of uh, Norwegian exports and or the, the share of Norwegian exports and the share of Chilean exports to in the world, world trade. But at the same time, I would also like to highlight the salmon import trends in the Asia Pacific in between Norway and Chile. As you can see, Norwegian salmon, the trends for Norwegian salmon and print for Chilean products, basically these are frozen and these are mostly fresh. Okay, now the popularity of salmon, what happened? Why it has gone up? Of course, as we mentioned that the region imported 160,000 tons of fresh and almost 400,000 tons of frozen salmon in last year and frozen salmon imports were higher. It was the sushi restaurant, and the takeaway, which was the major drive in salmon, in making salmon uh, popular over the last 10, 15 years. And the popularity, important thing is the popularity of salmon. It is unlike the Western markets, unlike the, 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 the US market, unlike the European Union and other European markets. It is not only just fillet and a stick that makes it popular in the supermarket trade. Um, as pointed out or as highlighted very correctly in the Norwegian Council's presentation that supermarkets love it because, or, or even the trade, in the, the, the trade, whoever is dealing with it, they love it because profit margin compared to, for salmon, compared to the other seafood products, even shrimp, which is the most popular in this region, is much, much higher. Why? Because nothing goes waste 
when fresh whole salmon comes gutted, uh, we are told that only 10% it out from the whole fish weight after taking the gills and got out. So 90% of the fish harvested after harvesting, when it comes to the market as a whole fish is about 90, 90% or uh, 95, uh, sorry, yeah, 10%, 90% or 85%. And then from there, nothing goes waste. Everything goes to the food basket from heads to tails. Heads, trims, skin, tails, besides steaks. So this is something that makes it popular, um, particularly or uh, to, to, to the retail trade, they love it, where consumers, of course, love it. They have, they have successfully marketed the product, these heads and trims and skins and tails to Asian consumers over the years which is really a good example. I would just like to find a highlight something. It's a very good example for aquaculture fisheries. The fish doesn't go into waste. It doesn't go to the fish meal much when it comes to the market. I'm not talking about of, on anything that is in Chile or Norway, but even in China, which is a major reprocessor of salmon, and they, they re-export, they import, and they, they process and re-export. I am 100% sure that all the heads and trims and skins and tails are going to the local food fish section. It's not going to the fish meat plant. So that's the beauty of this place. And I think the aquaculture sector worldwide have something to learn from the Norwegian salmon farming and the utilization as a food fish. Okay, so here are the products. Of course, this is the high value salmon. Yes, and then the steak, which is very common and sold as frozen. And then comes the trims, the tails, the belly trim, the head, the head again. Some heads are V cut, some heads are straight cuts. And then salmon ball that is Thailand. And uh, the other one is, okay, salmon skin, crispy fried. It's a tidbit that, it's available ready to eat in Thailand. Of course, Thailand is very much, uh, very much renovative and introducing again, I must say that Japan has 100 over uh, recipes. Thailand has 50 over recipes in how to prepare salmon and making it popular. Uh, and uh, of course, sushi and is the main thing as uh, over 3000 Japanese restaurant and in Thailand made it popular as a fresh, as raw fish, but cooked products are equally popular. And the head, you know, this one is, let me look back at my calculator. It was like 15 ringgit, 15 ringgit divided by four. One fish, one head is 3.8 US dollar. You no, know? so, uh, I mean, why shouldn't it be attractive to, to, to the marketers? It is attractive to them because of, of, uh, of, 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 of its utilization as a food fish. So now the reason why retailers and importers love it more, both, both, love, both, the, both the parties love it because if we look at the import price and the retail price and comparison, you can see how, what kind of margin they're having. And in Thailand, Fresh tuna, uh, sorry, fresh salmon is even double the price of what I'm, 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 I've written it here, but this is the Malaysian price that we are paying. Maybe because no tariff for fresh fish imports in Malaysia, and Thailand has a tariff on that. So the price is higher, double the price. But I'm, I want to say one thing here, the difference, price difference between the fresh and frozen is really, really wide in the Asian trade. I, we pay, 40 to $60 for fresh salmon, and we pay almost half or even less than that for frozen steaks. So that drives the, the demand for frozen salmon in Asian market, particularly the middle income group that they can afford to buy frozen salmon steaks uh, at a much cheaper price compared to the fresh salmon. And then comes the salmon head. This is the price which is coming from Chile on Europe to Asia. And this is the, the, the price in, in the retail trade. 
I was told by one of my friends in the Philippines that almost half of the products they're importing from Chile is frozen salmon head. So you can, we can see, and then bellies, the trims, and the tails. And the price is here, import price, and then the retail price. So that, that gives a very clear idea about why it is so, so popular to the marketers. Now, a consumer perspective, okay. Let me take it out and put another desk cap and put another cap as a consumer. I never liked salmon, never. In, it took me 15, no, more than 15 years since it was introduced to me. It was introduced to me in Norway by my, my very, very good friend, Mr. Eric Hempel, who was the director of InfoFish and who was also director of InfoFish. Um, when I went to Norway, he took me in Oslo restaurant and then he said, okay, this is Norwegian summer is very beautiful, you should take. I literally forced myself to eat that fresh Norwegian salmon on the plate cooked. But today I am a consumer for the like, can say last for the last two years and my monthly consumption is about my personal monthly consumption or weekly consumption is about three grams, sorry, 300 grams a week to 300 grams times four, 1.2 kilo, right? And then two of us in the family times two, so about two kilos. So who is in eating more fish or more salmon? Am I put, taking more shrimp, which is the, with the number one popular fish or seafood in Southeast Asia and Paris? No, I don't eat that much shrimp because, you know, at old age, they said, oh, no, this is not good. It's cholesterol, blah, 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 blah. This. But when it comes to salmon, this is omega-3. Frankly speaking, I'm not much concerned about omega-3. And I'm not a fan of sushi or raw tuna either. But I started liking salmon. Yeah, it's good. Very easy to, to prepare. Buy it, cook it. No, nothing much to do, nothing much to process, nothing much to cut. But one thing I must say that I like to buy it personally from the supermarket if possible, because I didn't have much good experience in buying online because the cold chain is not mentioned. And then the like frozen salmon comes, it's cut, thawed, again, packed into vacuum single vacuum pack and then again comes to me by the time, although they put ice and, and, and in insulated box, it's not the same as what I, I go to the market or supermarket, sorry, I ask them, okay, okay, gentlemen, can you slice the fish for me, the whole fish? Yeah, it slices frozen whole fish. I get the much better quality. So that is very, very important for me because I, I do understand a little bit about the quality of fish. So it's easy to prepare, as I said, and there are, so many recipes, Thai recipes, Malay recipes, probably you will have to invent the Indonesian recipes. But what I believe can drive consumption of salmon much, much higher is the affordable price factor. As I said, frozen sal salmon is to me, particularly the Chilean one, 30 to 40% cheaper compared to the fresh product. So naturally I go for frozen salmon and many people I'm sure do the same. One more item I would like to highlight to the marketers here. When it comes to Norwegian salmon, even frozen salmon, they come, they cut it into a steak. The price of fresh salmon and frozen salmon is almost the same for Norwegian product, the origin, because it's the perception of quality. But the cheaper one, what we get is basically from Chile. So, okay, I will stick to that, to the frozen product, as long as I know the, the quality of, 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 of the salmon. And that makes me uh, go more for salmon. And my, my suggestion to, to the Salmon Promotion Council or the marketers is that Okay, it is all, it's basically known as a sushi product or not sashimi sushi and the salmon, salmon steak and salmon filet. But if we can promote 
how to cook salmon in regional, regional styles in different countries, it will definitely benefit the marketers. I'm, I'm very, very sure because while I was searching what kind of product during last 24 hours, oh my God, I saw so many new recipes and I would like to definitely next one month, I would like to try a few recipes, the Thai recipes, the Malay recipes, and the Japanese recipe, the breakfast one. And that will certainly increase per capita, I mean, consumption of my household, uh, consumption of salmon. So uh, with that plea, I would, I would request that please make it affordable for us. I don't want to give up eating salmon now that I like it. So if it is affordable, definitely we'd like to go more for it. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to share my views with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. That, that was a, a very, very interesting uh, presentation on the consumer's perspective. Um, I have a question here from one of the participants. Um, the question is, uh, do you have any idea about the trends from Jan to June for this year for imports in the Asian markets of salmon in the Asian markets. The Southeast Asian um, markets. It is it is already reported in the Norwegian salmon two Norwegian salmon presentations. So okay. I you can just go through it one more time. Then it, it's very um, uh, thorough and, okay. uh, and 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 clear about product forms and uh, also different markets. Right. Thank you, Fatima. I'll move on now to the next presenter since we have uh, a few minutes uh, to go. Uh, so our next presenter is Mr. Diego Lagas uh, from Marel. Uh, he's going to talk, uh, present to us about salmon processing, catering to the consumer. So over to you, Diego. Thank you, Happy. And thank you, Sherlyn, and all the InfoFish teams for giving us the opportunity to participate today today here. Uh, let me share my screen. Let me start from the beginning, which is a good thing. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, very yes, good. So very good. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone. My name is Diego Lagas. I'm the Global Sales Director of uh, the Marrell Fish Division. And I'm very glad to be here with you today. And uh, my presentation is about uh, catering to the consumer. And I will try to explain you in the next uh, couple of minutes how technology is supporting and helping the salmon industry in Asia and other, and other parts of the world to transform the way fish is processed and also how it can support with the growth expected. I would like to start with the vision because a vision says a lot about a company and a vision guide us on, on us uh, on everyday actions and decision making. I think uh, in the previous presentations, we spoke about making the product more sustainable and more affordable. Fatima just finished saying, make my product more affordable so I, I, I can keep on with the consumption of, of the salmon. So we are saying that in partnership with our customers, we are transforming the way food is processed. And our vision is of a world where quality food is produced sustainable and affordable. Uh, Fatima mentioned many good things from the consumer point of view. And I think with this vision, we are trying to uh, basically uh, overcome all these objections, you know, you mentioned about uh, that you prefer to go to the market and look to, uh, with your own eyes the product because you know that uh, you are going to get what you expect. And this is one of the main issues, for example, of the e-commerce, you know, that when you ask for, for a meal one day and you like it, you expect that the day after when you order the same product, you receive exactly the same. So meaning that uh, your buying experience is exactly the same as the day before. I think the only way of doing so is through technology. And uh, of course, I mean, in, in Marrell, we have probably one of the best uh, engineers around the world. The world. And uh, 
visionaries that can make very good machines, but this is a that we cannot do alone. We need you. We need the market to understand what are the trends, what are the requests, and only by working together, we can make it possible. Uh, I stole one sentence of Jeff Bezos that says that overnight success takes 10 years. <laughs> Okay, so it took us a, <laughs> quite a long time to be in the position where we are today, having a global presence and incredible service, uh, being the most innovative company in the market uh, where we play and uh, building up a very strong platform. And it's only by, by having a very strong innovation that we are in the position we are today and we can support the industry moving, moving forward. We invest approximately 6% of our total uh, turnover in innovation. And uh, that is returned to the market with new and more innovative uh, solutions. And as you can see in, in this slide, uh, Marrell has revolutionized uh, the salmon industry since uh, 1983. Um, we have uh, launched to the market different solutions uh, always aiming to uh, increase yield and make our products more sustainable and more affordable, using as much as possible of the raw material and, of course, being transparent through trustability systems. The consumer is more interested uh, in knowing uh, where the product is coming from, and we are more and more um, demanding transparency in the entire value chain and only through uh, systems and integrated uh, software platforms, IoT, this is possible. Uh, in the past, uh, our primary focus, it was basically to transform something that it was alive in something that is eatable. Our mission today is maximize the value of these royals. So this is why we are investing more and more in uh, increasing the yield on the deheading process, increasing the yield on the filleting process, um, also avoiding, uh, let's say, the human touch on the product, uh, reducing the uh, bacteriological contamination of the product, making it more safe. And I think we all experienced that the pandemic has uh, accelerated, you know, the need of automation and technology to make our, our products not only more affordable and more sustainable, but also more safe. I, I, I will try to summarize what we all experienced last year and, and some of us we are still experiencing in, in, in the pandemic on the next video. As we all know, 2020 has been a year like no other. Although the world had to shut its doors for a while, consumers around the world still needed safe, affordable quality food on their plates every day. Driven by our passion for feeding the world sustainably, we have continued our journey of innovation. Despite the pandemic, our dedicated team of 1,000 innovation experts across 10 countries brought over 30 new breakthrough innovations to the market that are transforming the way food is processed. These new innovative solutions will be an important enabler to the supply of safe, affordable quality food to consumers worldwide. Automation, sustainability and digitalization are key drivers in all the developments that we brought to the market in 2020. We will continue to build on that important foundation towards the future. Every year, we invest 6% of our revenues in innovation, and we have dedicated innovation experts all over the world that work in close partnership with our customers on transforming the way food is processed. On our quest, we realized that everything counts, every step, every idea, every drop, and every person. Automation is a core feature in our developments at Morel. With automation, we keep moving the food industry to the future, step by step. In 2020, we saw the smartest whitefish plants in the world go live and major steps taken into the future of whitefish processing. We again delivered a new robot application to the market, the M-Line Bung Remover. Despite the circumstances, we made many important steps with our development customers on the robotics for the meat processing industry. We took significant steps forward in combining vision and robotics technology and transforming knowledge and insights from one industry to another. 
On our quest to transform the way food is processed, every idea counts. Our digital products play a key role in advancing food processing and in changing it from being supply-driven to demand-driven, meaning less waste and more flexibility. We are developing digital transforming solutions that provide more knowledge, more insight and more control in the food processing. Our digital solutions enable our customers in the poultry industry to create the maximum potential out of their morale line. We are taking important steps to evaluate our infrastructure further to best meet the future digital needs of our customers. Sustainability is at the heart of all our operations. All innovations must meet sustainability targets, where we focus on minimizing waste and maximizing quality in food processing. Every drop counts. Uh, sustainability was and remains a core value in our developments at Morel and the focus for all development teams in Morel. Extended reality solutions mixed with simulation and VR makes it possible to have a meaningful conversations about our systems with our customers without travel and face-to-face -face meetings. All over the world, we continue to work not only with our customers, but also with partners that are best in class in their field. We exchange knowledge and ideas in new ways in collaboration with our teams and customers all over the world. Everyone counts. In challenging situations, Morel teams have had to navigate through the pandemic and make sure that we are there for our customers. We strengthen our internal and external partnerships by thinking in terms of solutions. With close collaboration of our experts, we managed to provide transformative technologies in all industries we operated in. We look forward to continuing on our journey to transform the way food is processed in 2021. Well, I think all of us, we feel quite represented, you know, being locked down, not able to travel, uh, but uh, technology allow us to keep the world moving. And uh, new alternative communication tools allow us to uh, safeguard what is probably one of the most important value chains in the world, the food value chain. Something that is quite unique in Marvel compared with other uh, technological providers of the salmon industry is that uh, we all we have other divisions, meat and poultry, and we learn from the development of other market segments. And what you have in the screen at this moment is how the poultry industry has developed uh, in the last years and the last decades into the US market, moving from, uh, let's say, the whole bird uh, towards uh, representing 83% of the total uh, processing value to only 9%. And uh, we see how the product, it, it was more split in parts, making more portions, more fillets, and also further uh, processed. Uh, we believe that the salmon is, um, it has all the ingredients to basically follow the same path. So we are quite convinced that in the future, we will see more and more value added products uh, going out of or coming out of the of the salmon. Something that is very important for us to understand is how the technology is changing our lives. Uh, in the past, uh, before we had to take a decision, you know, we asked to ourselves what happened, you know. Then we moved to our diagnostic. So why did it happen? And what we are seeing now is technology is allowing us to be more predictive and more prescriptive. So basically asking to ourselves what will happen and what should I do? So we can anticipate you know, what is coming. In the past, we have seen how uh, humans have been supported by machines. Today, we have the, 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 tech, the software you know, supporting our decisions in the future, it will be the systems who are going to predict and monitor the trends and correct these deviations, basically to ensure the same quality and the same productivity, maximizing the yield and making our products more sustainable and more affordable. The digital journey, I think it is, it is wise to uh, spend some time on the digital journey and what tools we have available today to transform the way Salmon is processed. Uh, we need intelligent machines in order to be in the journey of the industry 4.0. Uh, 
And we are seeing a technology like artificial intelligence playing big roles, but it's not only about artificial intelligence, it's about cybernetics, it's about problem solving, about deep learning, machine learning, the use of robots and, and, and neural networks. We are spending a lot of time uh, in, in our R&D and developments and innovation into this technology. We, are, we will see a future where all of our factories will be connected. This is what we call a smarter processing. By having all this data in a data lake, you know, it will help us and it will help the producers around, around the globe to understand better the needs of the, of the market and also to follow the, the needs of the consumers. Many times we said that the, the consumer is setting the pace, but uh, we have seen as well how technology, you know, it's open up doors for the producers to come to the market with new products and open up new market segments, new SKUs, new categories in the supermarket. And probably uh, our friend Gonzalo will talk a lot uh, about this, uh, this subject later on. Uh, let me, yep. Now, here I just want to show you, uh, you know, how fast uh, the design of a factory is, is um, evolving. In the past, we had to make drawings, send this drawing to the, to the manufacturing facility, make a mocap, test it in a, in a factory, see if it works, it doesn't work, then come back, redesign, and send it back again. Now, thanks to the uh, vision uh, technology and uh, to the virtual reality, we can basically play like if we were building up our sim city, you know, on the video games. So we have created all of the different models that are more or less like Lego bricks. And uh, in a click of our eyes, we can basically have our uh, factory uh, design uh, according to our needs. And uh, of course, uh, it can be from a very small producer that simply needs like a weighing system or a small traceability system to a very large uh, solution like uh, we are installing, for example, in, in Norway, in Chile, China, and other, and other parts of the world. So what you are seeing is how our engineers, you know, they, they develop the solution according to the, to the different customer needs. And we can build up factories with the, you know, fully automated 100% uh, into the digital world and having enough flexibility to cope with the different market demands. Uh, and what you have uh, in your screen at this moment, what I'm displaying is one of our latest projects for secondary processing. And this could easily be a factory in whatever place in, in Asia that they are basically buying raw material from Chile or from uh, Norway or Canada or any other part of the world, uh, almost with not, no human touch during the process meaning that we can automatically depalletize and cut the strap of the boxes with robot systems, fill it into the beheading and, and filleting systems, having automatic uh, uh, quality control scanners that will determine what is the quality of this product and the, based on this quality, you know, send it to the different uh, further process uh, um, uh, upstreams in the, in the processing line. So this is an example of how the technology, you know, is changing the, the way food is processed. We have several promises. Uh, we are super committed with uh, sustainability and we promise to deliver carbon neutral machines, increase the yield, improve the quality and reduce the, the food waste. And of course, uh, uh, have enough data to track the environmental impact. We will be the first ones on launching to the market, what we call a green dashboard. So we will, now we are able to monitor what is the energy impact or water consumption in our testing facilities. So this is uh, uh, very relevant, you know, for everybody that is, uh, let's say, concerned with the, with the mother planet as, as we are. Uh, we spoke uh, before about the, the food loss, and uh, this is how do we see it. We think that uh, approximately between 30 to 35 percent of all the fish that is catch or produced in, in aquaculture is lost through our value chain. And uh, a big part of this loss, between 20 to 25 percent, it corresponds on the processing, packaging, and distribution. 
So we are committed to reduce this uh, food loss by increasing the, the use of our uh, raw materials and uh, um, securing uh, the quality in, in the process and also uh, making more use and more value of our, of our byproducts. And these are some of the examples, you know, of our uh, models, flagships, sustainable solutions. Uh, we have here on the left, our Rebo portioner. The Rebo portioner is a low pressure forming machine that basically with uh, almost not use of water, we can reshape all these uh, trims or byproducts and create uh, like a, a high quality form product that can get a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, but let's say a good price uh, in the market. Uh, um, we have the FlexiCat, that is a water jet cut technology. And uh, we are able to basically maximize the value of a salmon fillet with this water jet nozzle and the amount of water that we are using for uh, making all the cut patterns in a salmon fillet is the, is the volume that uh, gets inside of a, a teaspoon. So it is really, really minimal. We have sensor X technology. So we can check and detect if our product contains bones or it contains some rest of the skins. So we are investing heavily on ensuring the quality for uh, let's say assuring to the consumer to have the same experience again and again and again. We have developed a new salmon dehether with vision technology uh, where we not only match the, the yield of uh, the operators in a factory, if not, we are able uh, to increase the yield of the of the, the heading part. And uh, we are investing heavily, and I, I share it with you in, in other uh, e-dialogues uh, in InfoFish and another other venues uh, that we are investing, yeah, as I said, heavily in robot in robots for different applications, you know, for doing automatic packing of not only of the fresh. Uh, whole fillets, but portions, a slice, also frozen to avoid, you know, uh, the manipulation and reduce the uh, contamination, the product. And overarching everything, we have uh, the Innova uh, food processing software that enables the production to control uh, the machines, process, procedures in the plant, ensuring reliable data collection and traceability through the production process and through the entire value chain. Um, I'm reaching to the end of my presentation and I just want to show an application that um, I think uh, it fits really well to the Asian market. And uh, uh, all of you spoke about sushi uh, in Japan and in other places of the world like Thailand. Uh, and I just want to show you how a manual process can be transformed with the use of uh, technology in an automated process. So enjoy this video.
Okay, so I think uh, uh, this shows how technology, you know, can transform the way it, uh, uh, the way uh, fish is processed and transform an entire manual process, very traditional, with uh, with uh, an industrial process, making the product more affordable, more sustainable, maximizing the yield, and uh, ensuring the quality uh, every time. So I want to finish my presentation again with our vision and thanking uh, InfoFish for the opportunity because it's only together, you know, with you, dear customers, marketers, retailers, uh, that, you know, we can uh, transform the way uh, food is processed and the way that salmon is processed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diego, for that uh, very interesting uh, and uh, very informative uh, presentation. I just have a question here for you um, from one of the participants. And the question is, um, this is in relation to the digital technology. Uh, is it able to give information about every single fish when it is in culture stage of an uh, offshore operation of salmon? Yeah, that's the idea. Our, our, our digital products and the technology uh, basically what it does, it collects data of every individual. So we can uh, not only use it in our uh, processing facility, but also it can be used, for example, in the fish farming. With our QC scanners and the, uh, and the key factor, uh, we are able to basically to make like a very big uh, research in all and every individual salmon fillet that is passing through our lines collect all this data, send it back to the farm, you know, and tell them, okay, you know, uh, the shape of the salmon or the amount of gaping <laughs> or the color of the, of the meat, you know, is better in this place or another. So they can compare, for example, with the diets that they are using or the kind of pellet that they are feeding the, the salmon. So, uh, as I said, you know, we are into the processing part of the value processing chain. However, we are linked and we, we, we think always how we can contribute to improve the entire value chain and the QC and the K fact K factor is just one an example. I have another question here. Um, does Marel make uh, equipments for the small medium scale sector where space may be limited? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know our <laughs> our our supply it goes from a very let's say simple scale, just to, to wait and re register the weight data with a small label printer, I mean, uh, up to a complete uh, factory. So, I mean, the title of, or the heading, the heading of my presentation, it was, uh, let us grow with you. And this is what we are always looking for, you know, to grow with, uh, with the companies. I mean, no one is starting being big, we either. So we are a start, we, I mean, we were in a startup 40 years ago. So we understand that, you know, uh, every process, it, it takes uh, a maturation process, a maturation time. So, uh, of course, I mean, uh, we, we are delighted to work with the small producers uh, and share with them our experiences and, you know, uh, make them more, let's say, profitable and, and, and show them how technology can make them more competitive in their operations and in their business. So definitely, yeah. Um, I, I have a okay. question, um, sure. quick one. Uh, Diego, is, is Barrel involved in uh, doing a deep frozen loins like tuna? Minus yeah, we, yeah the, the answer is yes, we have thawing systems. So yeah, uh, we can, we can, def, the, yeah. Uh, Are you doing frozen. salmon? We are doing salmon. We are doing salmon. Yeah, yeah. We we have we have installations made in, for example, in China. You know where? Mm -hmm. I mean, you. I think you, you did a great presentation. I mean, uh, Southeast Asia, China is more about frozen than fresh. You know, so if we want to support this industry, uh, the very first step on the process is thaw that product. So yes, we have solutions into that, and our experts will be more than happy to 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 support you, Fatima, on this. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Diego, for that presentation and for Thank that uh, response. Um, 
just a quick uh, reminder to all our participants. We have the poll questions that is uh, our, that has been launched. You can just click on the poll, uh, which is available at the bottom of the screen. We'll now move on to our last presenter for today, uh, for this event, and we have uh, Mr. Gonzalo Campos, who is going to be presenting on packaging innovations, adapting to convenience. I hand over now to Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation of InfoFish and the opportunity to address this uh, fantastic audience and then I was still there. And uh, my perspective is going to come from uh, the European part of the business. Right, so are you able to see the screen, right? Yes. All right, so let's just get it started. And uh, the presentation today is called uh, Packaging Innovation Adapting to Convenience. And uh, basically, uh, I'm going to be providing you several ideas on how we can increase the proportion of salmon into the retail products in your regions. So, but let's get started with the most important information, which is who we are, right? So we are in business to protect and to solve critical packaging challenges and leave our world better than we found it. Here below, you can find some of our brands, Cryobag for food packaging, and a, a bubble wrap and auto bag for all the divisions. And basically, what is that we do? So we are making sure that we protect the most essential uh, food with our essential packaging, right? So our solutions create a efficient, global, and secure uh, supply chains. And in the other side, we are protecting packaging solutions to enhance the commerce through fulfillment uh, and protect the worldwide movement of goods. So our pledge on circularity and plastics by 2025 is extremely pragmatic because we're going to give 100% of our solutions are going to be designed to be recyclable or reusable, and this is very powerful. And 50% of that is going to have an average uh, recycled content of which 60% will be coming from post-consumer recycled content. And we're boosting global collaborations around the world in order to increase the recycling and reuse uh, rates. And recently, uh, we announced our net zero carbon emissions that is, are going to be applied by 2040. So how do we move forward into our sustainable packaging strategy? Well, very simple, you know, we uh, try to promote reduction of the packaging plastic usage, so reduction of microns and the use of virgin resins. We promote strongly the recycling and using recycling uh, structures uh, which are preparing for recycle to be recyclable and recycling content. So we are very privileged to be the recipient and uh, of the CDP uh, engagement leader, you know, because this is a, a pragmatic way to show how we're not only uh, engaging in environmental uh, actions, but we are moving into actions and there's clear KPIs here. So pivoting after the C-19 with healthy, safer, affordable, and consistent nourishment for very important customers. So the presentations that were before me were very fantastic and pragmatic as well, because you are showing me that there is an elder population and, and there is a younger population, and both of them are extremely important. Both of them want to enhance the immunity, and they want to look for relevant products that could boost uh, their health, but also are fitting in the lifestyles. And which could be these products? We're gonna be talking a little bit about all these packaging systems as we move forward. And as you can see, the sashimi, the sushi, Marer just presented a great example of how they are enabling this uh, uh, automated process. You know? And here I am in the, on this part, on this right side, I just want to uh, show you how we can bring consistency from the traditional form that you are showing sushi into how we can bring a more consistent and longer shelf life products actually looking more artisan, as you can see with our BDF packaging system right here, which is a shrinkable barrier bag system, fully automated. We will be showing more about that. 
So what are the trends that we can see in the fish sector and some insights? So as it was mentioned again by Morel, digitalization is helping accelerating the change and processes could leverage sustainable packaging to help delight the new audiences. And I talk about audiences because it's not only uh, buying from the supermarket or from markets, that, that means physical presence. Now consumers are buy, buying directly from the mobile, right? So it was also mentioned that it has increased tremendously the e-commerce in certain parts of Asia. So what are consumers looking for? Health and wellness. And basically not only, not only healthy for their minds, but also healthy for the guts. That means boost their immunology with nourishment foods. They're also looking for easy to cook and they are rediscovering convenience and they need simple and variety in order to be, to, to, be, um, uh, to serve as an impulse for them to be buying. But the channels are shifting, right? So the customers, as I mentioned before, they're not only buying in the physical store or physical markets, but they are buying maybe through um, uh, food service services, through takeaway, e-grocery, direct to consumer, and so on. However, in Europe, as we can see right now, the consumers are at home, but I imagine in many other places in the world, you are still having such a hybrid system where uh, there are some people at home either studying or working. So how are we going to uh, enlighten and um, bring more convenience to their nourishment? So we have to think about that and we're going to be showing you some solutions for that. And sustainability is in everything we do. The industry is embracing strongly circularity. And as in our company, we are developing uh, structures that have uh, recyclable content and they're compatible with different streams, which are RIG1, RIG4, and RIG5. So if food waste were a country, and this is very important, just let's take a look of the image on the left. If food waste with a country, uh, the, you, you can see that certain countries are going to have a high, you know, emitting of food wastage. And therefore, if we use a focus on food wastage per se, it could be a, a country by itself, as you can see here in the graph, right? So what are the factors that are very important for consumers when they're choosing grocery products in China, for example, in a study a couple of years ago? So basically reduce food waste is a priority for them, reduce carbon footprint and environmental packaging. And what could be the factors that are important for the same Chinese consumer, but when buying grocery uh, through e-grocery food, right? So food safety, price and logistics. And this is important because packaging is here to help put a focus on food security and shelf life as an effective approach to reduce food waste and improve the resource usage. So what are the key packaging sustainable attributes? So starting from protection, transparency, right? You have to show what the quality that you have, extend shelf life, reduce food waste, but there are a lot of functionalities that actually are extremely important, such as mechanical resistance, um, other functionalities that could be uh, helping to extend shelf life, such as heat treatment, um, pasteurization, microbiability, HPP treatment, compatibility with the novel technologies, sealing, and resource reduction. All of these contribute to the great performance of the packaging system and to the circular economy and recyclability. So salmon retail success story in Europe. Let's see, let's see what has been, uh, what, what could be the benchmark that we can use for your region, right? And I strongly believe category development and the well management of these categories was extremely successful. However, packaging did play a strategic and crucial role. So, we have in, uh, a product that I think Diego mentioned that 61% yield uh, so far. And uh, I know that, that with all the modern technology, they are const constantly in this bench and these KPIs. But so far, you know, out of this uh, fantastic yield, you know, in, in certain markets, this fish has become the reference number one and the reference number three meaning of all of the SKUs, the stop keeping unit that is sold in a supermarket, number one and number three 
are salmon, at least in key regions of uh, Europe. And it's made accessible and versatile, affordable, and it could be as an aperitif and a starter, a main course, a cooking ingredient, snacking and seasonal. So it was mentioned that uh, uh, in previous presentation that so many recipes are in Japan and so many recipes are in Thailand. And I believe in all Asia, you can just apply all your know-how and transform this uh, culinary masterpiece into something local for sure with the right packaging. And what could be that packaging? So Ben, basically we have here some solutions which could be vacuum packaging, okay? Starting from a shrink bag or ovenable bag below here, or we have some vacuum pack, pack you know, this is called, a, it's a global commodity, the chain pack, or vacuum pack for slices products. On the MAP packaging side, this is something that will have a modified atmosphere packaging, right? Usually CO2, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, oxygen is almost not used in Europe on this uh, type of products, but it depends on the supply chain. It depends on the product. It could be useful. But uh, uh, these are different packaging systems that are under the umbrella of MAP packaging. And one that I like to remark that is about to transform the sushi experience, and I invite you to explore it in your region, is the VDF uh, packaging system. You know, uh, from a traditional uh, black and clear clamshell, you can have something very artisanal, amazing for a custom made without any molds in your region. And also the tray leading, we will talk about that. So a skin packaging is below. So we have so many different systems falling into this umbrella, starting from products that could be very convenient, made out of the dark fresh technology. We will explain about that, a skin packaging in roll stock, a skin packaging with pre-made tray, the state-of-the-art skin packaging with zero scrap, the dark fresh tray, or we are also enabling the latest uh, carbon uh, skin packaging with the liners and also with uh, with the top webs. Let's move forward here. Sorry about that. All right. So, do you have the right salmon packaging to deliver value, trust, and operation excellence and point of sale? Do are you relevant to your customer? And this is very important, like because uh, uh, we 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 have to decide who is the customer, what is the cold supply chain that we have. What is the sustainable oriented innovation strategy that you want to implant in this place? And uh, after that you have uh, clear, then we can think about a packaging strategy that could involve either MAP or a skin packaging. So a very quick uh, remark here, uh, you see here, I have highlighted here, uh, when you have uh, some MAP packaging system, some organolectic uh, uh, challenges, such as potential gapping, it could be very obvious, right? I'm not saying that this is a packaging system is not valid, it's completely valid, it extends shelf life, it delivers a premium product, it's amazing. However, I just want to uh, remark that some of these organolectic points would be visible, right? So uh, in a skin packaging, you don't have those challenges because basically the muscle is tied together and you keep it completely uh, in great presentation throughout the whole shelf life in fresh uh, or frozen as you, uh, as you like. And then we have different formats, right? Flexible, flexible, all the way to different. You can customize your pack depending on the, on the, on the desire for the market. Then MAP packing system, and then below you have the roll stock and bags technology that could bring different consumer experience in your market. So could innovative packaging help consumers adopt new habits? I can guarantee you that, and I'm gonna show you more. So this is just some success stories, uh, let's say uh, mostly from Europe, but also grabbing some great success stories that my colleagues in Asia uh, share with me from different regions, Korea, Singapore, and China. Okay, so you can see here, right? And uh, so consumers perceive fish as healthy and they're trailing up for new healthy, tasteful, easy, and convenience experience. I invite you to not hesitate to take this, uh, I call it a masterpiece, this uh, fantastic protein, Atlantic salmon, and there to nourish your societies locally. 
So could the right branding strategy and packaging enables decommoditizing the Atlantic salmon market? This is just an example of how the two global leaders, the, uh, they are both Norwegians, you know, this is Maui, and below here is Leroy, how they are different, um, uh, they're creating different uh, categories, some for local markets, some for exports, and they're using different technologies. For example, this would be, the, this ones right here would be MAP packaging, but then the rest, it will be a skin packaging, the same as here. So they are accelerating value to the market, they're developing the category, and they're le really leveraging a leadership role in the market and in the shelves, for sure. This is just a benchmark for you in Europe, in, in Asia. So the supply chain is optimized by automation. Uh, Diego talked extensively about this, and I truly believe that. So I just give you here a little, uh, this is a, a, a new system that we have, a Cryovac SBS 45 is a new inline automated system to do trim back packaging. It could be fantastic for the heads, so it could be for the portions. You know, we have a different packaging systems for a skin packaging here or for MAP packaging here. But the most important thing is for you to focus on yield, efficiency, efficiency, traceability, develop a category, and improve the shell through automation. What could be uh, something that uh, it could be extremely helpful and pragmatic if you have a customer that is asking you for sustainability in your region, for example, in Europe, we're doing this in the chain pack. You know, we're bringing packaging weight reduction with this game changer. You know, they used to use uh, 60 to 80 microns uh, web. You know, now they're using 33 micron plastic in the top as the application, and they're reducing tons of plastic. And it's a fantastic more than 50% packaging weight reduction. So, if we talk a little bit about tray leading applications, shrinkable films or non shrinkable films. You know, we have it all, we have a broad portfolios. Here's some examples again, shared to me by my colleagues in Asia, where they're using barrier materials. Okay, this is from, from uh, Europe. This is uh, something that created a tremendous success in Spain, thanks to Marel technology, and in the combination of Silder technology to transform the salmon presentation in the Iberian Peninsula market. I'm very proud of this product. And also, if you want to take the experience further and you want to, deliver uh, easy to cook or ready to cook product. We do have multiple uh, portfolio that it could also gonna give you uh, packaging weight reduction and sustainability, but it's going to enable you to bring convenience with a 39 microns, P11 one piece, anti-fog, and a barrier. I mean, every single functionality that you can imagine and this material will help you. And it's gonna be great for takeaway, uh, or for, uh, for e-commerce inclusion. So we are gonna bring reassurances for merchandising, protection, hermeticity, and shelf life extension. If we talk about Cryovac brand, Dafresh, this is our core uh, brand for skin packaging. You can see here again, you know, I'm very proud of the great collaboration we do with uh, Morel globally. And uh, you can see here some examples that uh, uh, from a customer here, I'm sorry, the pronunciation, Shen Xian Tian Wen. And they are, they are leveraging all this advanced technology from Morel, and they are finally integrating the end of the line with our fresh technology to create these amazing uh, sushi products uh, that you can see. So the technology is right here. This is a demonstration of how fantastic it is, you know, 360 degrees, depending on the selection of the products in the European market. Uh, customers are trying to go to more transparency. They're using uh, materials that are pet-based. And uh, to stay competitive, definitely you need to reduce the use of plastics, decrease the carbon footprint, reduce food waste, and uh, feed the needs of the omni-channel. I mean, this, this is a basic right now. Whatever packaging selection that you have should be ready for the omni-channel. And this is one of the best. It's meeting the e-commerce needs. Okay, due to the cubic uh, feet uh, configuration. So what is that fresh? You know, I've been talking a lot already about that fresh. So basically it's a packaging that does a counter uh, seal. It fully seals the product uh, comparing to uh, thermoforming. You know, thermoforming seals only on the periphery. And then on thermoforming, you can only, only go down 
in Darfresh, you can put you can uh, thermoform and you can protrude as well. So you can see the big difference here on the red. I'm trying to highlight that juices could accumulate. Uh, the pack presentation may not be outstanding. So here you may have a, a great solution on the Darfresh, and please consider it. We have so many uh, different um, uh, systems within the Darfresh packaging system. You know the one that is Darfresh Rollstore, where you create your own pack or pre-made trays or the advanced and state-of-the-art our fresh one trade technology, which is uh, also growing in Asia. And as far as dark fresh, we continue here again, you can reduce the, the plastic waste and uh, the plastic weight as well. And you can print up to 10 different colors and you can have easy opening. So basically it's a more sustainable portfolio reassuring the food safety, the user experience, and it's ready for the omni-channel. And if we move on, you know, are you going to pack to a PET base or to a PP base or to a PETP base? I mean, we have it all, or even to a cardboard. I mean, rely with confidence on our company. We have a broad portfolio to serve multi and opportunities. And uh, more sustainability logistics, you know, you can put more packs in the master pay in the master box if you are in dark fresh skin packaging and you can also use less transport if you move from this technology into this technology here. And what is the, how do we get started? Basically, before we even put one plastic in the market, we design everything, we do 3D projects, you know, and then finally we move into prototyping. So digital prototyping is first, then we select exactly what you want to make, and then we decide based on your production estimates, which is the right system, either for small, medium, or high production. We don't think only about materials. We think about turnkey solutions. So basically, we're going to help you and support you with primary packaging, secondary packaging, packaging equipment, and packaging automation. We are in this graph here. You can see here this part here is a pad liner for thermal insulation, 100% paper, fully recyclable. And it has been awarded the winner in, Austra in, um, in Australia for the Sign and Packaging Award you know, for sustainability. So this is just to reassure you that your e-commerce is in secure hands and you can um, uh, move forward whenever you're ready. So some examples here, I'm about to finalize my presentation just to highlight that Italy is really embracing the skin packaging. You can see in the image below, one, two, three, there's more reference of salmon in the shelf, you know, great freshness, great machines and performance. You can see here the success story from Grand Frey. And we're very proud of this retailer. They are really elevating the experience with an authentic and fresh retail pre packed seafood destination in France. And almost everything is in the skin packaging and in dark fresh. And to finalize here, we have uh, simple steps. If you want to bring convenience to your customers, we can do it in different ways. We can do it with pre-made tray, or we can do it with a roll stock tray. So basically, uh, we have material top webs, either 75 or 100 microns, high barrier, peelable, pasteurizable, microwebable, and fit for use for HPP even, if you are interested to bring more convenience in your market. So we're basically, by fixing the product, you can benefit from vertical merchandising, horizontal merchandising, e-commerce, and so on. And so more examples from the UK in Frozen, you know, benefiting from this technology. From Singapore, you know, I actually they are using HPP as well. And to finalize here now, you do have the latest and uh, equipment, which is semi-automated, you know, it's an entry level, scrap free to open the market with the skin packaging. You can do this um, up to 1 million trays per year, okay? And this is based on the dark fashion tray technology, the state-of-the-art technology uh, with innovative uh, vacuum system that goes through the bag and a special cutting of the film where you have zero scrap. You know, you cut the film right to the dimensions of the tray. So some examples from Asia that are already benefiting with this technology. And last but not least, as a conclusion, let's make it fresh available, healthy, and easy to cook destination. And we like to highlight that the most important thing is to reassure quality and sustainability with the best protection. 
then together as partners in the region, you know, we can enable quality, category development, food safety, trust, and a fantastic user experience. If the product is not available, it will never be bought. So it's very important to make it affordable, but first available. And thank you very much and ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo, for that uh, uh, presentation on packaging innovation. Um, I just have a question here. Um, the question is, um, you know, Atlantic salmon is a very high value uh, fish products. It's a very expensive pro uh, protein. How is uh, sealed air packaging navigating around this issue uh, and ensuring that the product is price affordable? Correct. Great question. You know, this, uh, this is actually a very important question because it could stop any project. If at the end of the day, the customers are not going to be able to buy it in one for one hand. In the other hand, if the processor is not going to be able to afford it, right? Afford the technology, I mean. So uh, we, we as, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, we do have, uh, in, when I put in the automation part, you know, we do have a whole a portfolio of equipment that starts from entry level, you know, all the way to fully automated equipment. Uh, guaranteeing high productivity and high production. So I believe, I'm confident that any, uh, even small players could uh, start exploring our technologies. And then when you are able to custom make the product with the, with the packing technology selected, you know, you, and you're able to bring a value such as extension of shelf life and or making products that could be um, C rated, Therefore, you are bringing um, affordability to customers. You know, they, they could see immediately that, they, that the product is not really expensive. They can use one portion and the other one for another occasion with, uh, and having the full shelf life throughout, uh, throughout the time. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's another question here. Um, what is the best and most sustainable packaging system for salmon, let's say for small processes and for big ones? You're asking the right questions. Okay, so the, the, the most sustainable packaging for salmon is the one that the market uh, actually can actually recycle, you know, because uh, we, we design, we create packaging that are designed for recycling, but then the recycling stream needs to be available, uh, whatever the packaging is going to be, correct? So, but uh, we can, uh, we can uh, show you a whole different type of packing systems, which I'm very confident that they are all using design for recycling structures and a very high content of post-consumer recycle in their structures. So I am confident that in, uh, in um, many countries with the right recycle streams, any of the packaging systems selected could be uh, sustainable. However, if you do want to optimize your operational efficiency, if you want to optimize your uh, sustainability, I would strongly recommend to go through skin packaging. Right. Um, yeah, we have a question from Fatima. Yes, Fatima. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Gonzalo, I, as a customer, I'm concerned about the extra cost I'm paying for this uh, convenience, quality assurance, and in, in terms of percentage. How much, how many percent extra cost, ad, additional cost that additional, uh, yeah, a customer would pay when we are buying this kind of packaging? Of course, I, I, I have no doubt about the quality of the packaging, and but cost is a factor. Because sometimes if I go to the supermarket, I look at the product, it looks very beautiful, but then I said, my God, maybe the product inside is cheaper than the packaging, you know? so. Uh, so that that's a concern. So how do, how how do you explain to a customer that is worth doing that? Okay, let's let a very very good question, but let me put it in another way. Okay, I mean everything has a cost and quality has a cost, obviously, right? So, but um, uh, if you're an expert of fish, 
correct? I, I saw your fantastic presentation and you know that the most important thing is to keep quality. If you don't keep quality, we are creating food waste and imagine the cost to society and the cost to environment, not to pack. Just, I mean, that is, uh, that is even much higher than anything. You know, so uh, fish could spoil in a in few minutes, in hours, you know what I mean? So I think that uh, it's not so uh, critical uh, what is the cost of that small portion, or let's say that uh, fish head, you know, that is going to give you seven, eight, one year, two years of shelf life, depends if it's fresh or frozen, but it's going to give you uh, all the guarantees of food safety, nourishment, and everything. So yeah, there's going to be a cost for sure. You know, the cost could be depending on the design, depending on the microns, depending on the systems, all the way from four cents to 10, 20 cents per pack. You know, it depends, right? But but the value is to keep, for example, if you have a fish that has exudates, those exudates, you know, it's not just juices that are coming out. Those juices are amino acids. Those juices are vitamins. Those juices are uh, texture, are flavor, are color that is coming out of the protein. So if I can guarantee that those juices are not going to leave the product and therefore the, the, the product is going to be wholesome, natural for seven days, for 10 days, for whatever it is, you know, as I said, if it's fresh, frozen, pasteurized, whatever, I think that the value of packaging is huge. You know, so I think that this is the mindset, you know, the Diego mentioned something very important, the consistency, you know, guarantee consistency of the product every day, but beyond that, every second, you know, you know all the time, the same great quality where that you can actually put your brand, you know, and feel proud of it. I think that, that is invaluable. May I add something to what Gonzalo is comment? I think I think we have to see this from a holistic point of view, you know. And the, the packaging is only one part of the value chain, and it's only one. I mean, one step on the on the processing part. And I think we have to look this, as I said, from a holistic point of view, and think about how technology packaging can make our operations to be more efficient, you know, because packaging is a basic hygienic factor. So if we have, you know, um, Norway that is doing greatly on having like the best, you know, salmon in the world, uh, spending two years of time, money, effort, energy on making a great product, and then we destroy it, you know, in two minutes in a factory or not having the right packaging, uh, the impact is huge. Then, then for the consumer, you know, um, we think that the value chain is not uh, reliable, is not credible, is not sustainable. So I understand your question, Fatima, but I think you know the message that we have to send to the Asian market is how the Asian producers can be more competitive, you know, from their from an operations point of view. And packaging is is one angle. Processing is another angle. Securing the quality of the raw material is another angle. Transportation is another angle. Correct. Fully agree with Diego. You know, we are here just making sure that your investment, you know, pays off the best way, you know, where you're proud of uh, to build it, you know. So we're guaranteeing food security. Food security has no price. And we're guaranteeing food waste reduction. So everybody deserves the right to be fed and have a nourishment food. So I think that uh, uh, as a holistic point of view, we are here to make sure that, uh, that you know, to, to deliver food security and reduce food waste. This is important, extremely important. We have to feed 9 billion people or more. Uh, yeah, you see why I'm asking this question because when we deal with developing nations, where they are also developing products, convenient products for the urban population, particularly in, in South Asia, where it's a huge population, few billion. If you put together, you know, two, three billion people and uh, middle-income people, middle-income uh, 
population is growing, their income is growing, they are concerned about the environment. But we need to tell the processors, the producers, that these are the things we need to take care. The fisherman knows how to take care of the quality of a high value product. They know, let me tell you, in this, even in Southeast Asia, they don't have all these packaging things. They have eyes. They use the only thing they can keep the, the quality of high value fish is the ice. They use that. But in the processing plant, if you go to the population, for example, I'm from Bangladesh. The capital is Dhaka, 20 million people in the city. Every corner you see a supermarket. And all these packaging materials are available now. So we have to advise the producers, it's not only fish, but protein, that which will be the best way because educated consumers, they care about environment. They don't mind to pay a little bit more for, their, for, for that. At the same time, the quality is maintained for them, for, for the customer to buy. So that's why we need to learn. For me, I need to learn that they will say, okay, this is the product. How do I know that it, it is worth paying that because of this kind of packaging? Why should I pay that much of price, even though I can afford to buy it? So thank you. And it's a unified message, what we have to send to the industry, you know, look at the people we are here today. You know, we are all the actors. So it is, and as, you know, our vision, is, I think, stated very clearly, it is together, you know, that we can transform the way fish is processed and the way fish is presented to the consumer. But of course, if, if some of the actors, if some of the stakeholders on the value chain doesn't understand it, we have to work together basically to have a unified message. Because if you don't believe on what Gonzalo is saying, it will be extremely difficult for you to transmit it, you know, to the to the processors in Asia. So maybe we can have like a separate meeting with you, Fatima, you know, between Gonzalo, mm -hmm. myself, just to, to go through it and and you know, because we need a message to the Asian market, that's for sure. You know, and, and consumers actually consumers are ready to accept something good for them. Mm -hmm. They are ready to accept. But my personal concern is the processing side. Whether okay, here am I. I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> the processors or the people who make the food available or the product available yeah. to the consumer, uh, they need to be convinced uh, because. As far as I am concerned, what I can see, what I am learning, looking at the, at, 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 uh, I mean, uh, studying the population behavior, consumer behavior, people are ready to, to go for something good for mm -hmm. them, for the environment, for the world, for their children, for the next generation. Exactly. We're here to support you on that one. Yeah. And just to, just to finalize on, on a quick comment that you made, Farima. Uh, it's fantastic that you say, you know, uh, that um, people are using ice, right? Because it's very important to keep the cold chain. But uh, on, on some traditional knowledge that we may have, uh, yes, this ice is fantastic. We need to keep the cold chain, but uh, some ice in direct touch of the product, you might burn it, you yeah. know, or you might take away the color or you might take away the flavor or you, so all of, all of this is great. You know, but then we have to bring modern knowledge and modern technologies in order to make it even better. You know, so we're yeah, ready even, to support you. Even, yeah, sorry. Even for the salmon steak I bought, vacuum packed, when it came to a came to my home, it was a little bit thawed, and I can see the color running, and it was vacuum packed. And I'm th and, and we are cautioning. Okay, the orange color comes out. What is this? So the feed. So do they use something in the feed to make the color orange? Otherwise, why should it run out of the fish? It doesn't look good. So, you know, that kind of question. So yeah. what is vacuum there, part there, that is that, not properly no, that, done? That, that didn't have anything to do. It's basically you lose volume from uh, the frozen state into the chill state. I mean, that, that, that's a different conversation. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is, I, I think, true, I think, I, I, you visual, know, Fatima. The visual effect immediately I see, I said, oh, oh dear. This is not yeah, but but you know you, you need a skin packaging. That's why they yeah. need the skin packaging. <laughs> if the raw material is bad, you know, 
we cannot do miracles on processing, no, transforming no. that is bad oh, and good. No, no. And, you know, oh, packaging no. cannot be something that is bad and something that is good. No. So, I mean, uh, there are different, much more different angles to look at, you know, what, why the color of a certain product is wrong in a package, yeah. you know. I, I do understand because of my involvement with the fishery trade mm. that I knew that the cold chain was not maintained. The frozen fish was cut into steaks and then the cold chain wasn't maintained between the cutting and repacking into vacuum packs. And, but they put it again on the ice, but it's already gone. It's a, it's a fatty fish. So exactly. This is the thing. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo, for that uh, presentation and for that uh, interesting discussion between Fatima and Diego. Um, yeah, so I think we've gone over time. Uh, and uh, I probably jump back to Paul. Just one quick question before we end off this uh, event. Uh, the question is, uh, sorry for putting you on the spot. Uh, will Norwegian exports disappear when te new technology makes it possible to produce salmon in Asia? No, I don't think so. I think that the, the, the markets will grow. Uh, and even though that we see locally produced salmon in Asia in the future, the market cake will grow so much that it will be still be, be, be um, demand for Norwegian salmon. Uh, I think that the market will expand. Uh, for example, in, in South Korea, where it, you know approximately only have a, bigger sized salmon, six plus. I think when you when they start farming uh, salmon onshore, um, they will have a, a, a whole range of, of different sizes to, to, to choose from. And, and these uh, smaller sizes will go into, consum into consumption in, in uh, a lot huger varieties of product than we see today. So in the future, I, I believe that we will see salmon will be consumed in a, a, whole, a lot more different occasions than uh, today uh, and in, a, in, in, different, uh, in different ways. And that will expand the market cake and uh, from my perspective, where in Norway we, we, we have a consumption of 10 kilos per capita, uh, in, in South Korea it's, it's less than one kilo, the, the potential is huge for growing. Who do, yes. you, who do you think in Asia would be successful in, in salmon farming? From your experience, oh. from Norwegian experience, and who do you think? potential candidates to be Korea is really ahead of the game right Paul yeah, yeah. Uh, South Korea and uh, they'll start up there South Korea and, and, and Japan are in the in the forefront um, but when the technology will be uh, available for, for everybody uh, so to speak in the, in the future uh, I believe that there will be uh, some of production in, in, in several more countries and the technology will also could also be used for other species as well, where you don't need to have the cold water uh, to produce the fishing. What about Australia? Because in Tasmania, it is indigenous; it is there, but they have. I, we don't see much development in terms of volume uh, in in that area. No, of course there are restrictions there, as in in all salmon producing countries. Uh, with today's technology. So, especially regarding the, the licenses, that is, of course, you, you don't get licenses to increase the production uh, as they may maybe want to. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Fatima, for that uh, response and discussions. Uh, we uh, have... I have a question yeah. for the audience, if you don't mind. And how do you see, meanwhile, the volumes grow in Asia, you know, uh, for the local farms uh, with the air IS, you know, how about the exports from, uh, of, uh, because uh, we noticed that uh, several programs in Europe are already exporting successful programs of prepack products into, into Asia. 
you know, do you see that uh, growing? I mean, that could be a question for anybody. I mean, uh, imports of pre-packed products, you know, which have the, you know, they, they have all the food safety guarantees from the European uh, authorities, EFSA or so on. How do you see it? Do you see that uh, growing? Do you know any, Fatima or Paul? You are, you... Uh, are, you, are you referring to exports from this region growing? No, in, imports from your region, exports from Europe of pre uh, you know, pre-packed products already, you know, consumer -packed, unit packs. Pre-packed products from Europe to Asia? Yeah, yeah I see, we see it, we see it increasing. Uh, yes, it is. Definitely, as, as we know that um, even looking at the brand, Norwegian salmon, you know, for example, it's already established brand and they don't really look at the price for who buy it. Like that, there are certain products, certain countries have the reputation of maintaining the quality and taking care of environment, the packaging and, and everything and, and, and consumers interest. Um, the restrictions on imports are going out, slowly getting easier with the WTO regulations and everything. And with rising income, definitely in urban Asia, there will be more demand for pre-packed products. Even a country, okay, we are looking at China right now, right? For example, salmon. If you look at India, India had, a, had an agreement with Norway on salmon imports for long, actually a long time back, I think no more than 10 years ago. But if we look at the, at the uh, development in consumer intake of salmon over there is still very, very small, but it's a, it's a big market. Of course, you can say that, yeah, maybe half of them are vegetarian, but that's not really true. But in the South, people do like fish. In the East, people do like fish. Bangladesh, you will be surprised. People pay 500 US dollar per meal to go to Japanese restaurant and have salmon sushi. You think it's a poor country? No, it's not. That, that, that is gone. These this middle income people, they're moving to higher income people and they want fashionable product, they want trendy product, they want safe product and they are ready to pay for it. So we must not underestimate the trends in developing markets and people do follow Japan as successfully. Japan has promoted the product in, I mean, all over Southeast Asia and even East Asia. Might not be in India, but some places, Norway, uh, sorry, even uh, what do you call the, uh, uh, Nepal, Nepalese are buying, Bhutanese are buying, landlocked countries, small volume, but the buy is already introduced to them. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, for the great answer. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Gonzalo. I, I believe there's no other comment or questions from anyone. Um, if not, then we'll end off the, uh, the, the dialogue today. Uh, I'd like to say here that uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you to all the panelists for your presentations, for all that interesting discussions that we had. Also a special thank you to all our participants for your questions and also for your comments that you've sent or submitted to us. Um, special thank you again to Norwegian Seafood Council, uh, also to Marel, thank you so much for uh, assisting uh, InfoFish with this uh, webinar. Um, also uh, just a note to everyone, to all the participants that please uh, make sure to fill the poll questions that is available on the bottom of your screen. Um, the recording of this uh, event will be available on our YouTube uh, channel. So please um, click on the link that is available on the, uh, the chat box. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for participating in this uh, event. Don't forget to follow us on our social media accounts for news and updates uh, in future. So from all of us here at uh, InfoFish, uh, we would like to say thank you, goodbye, and uh, stay safe.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Zalo, Fatima. Thank you. It was very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Bye bye.